Our next speaker is Elina Hartikainen, who is a core fellow here at the Helsinki Collegium for Advanced Studies. And the title of her presentation is Making, Participatory, De Making Participatory Democracy, the Discursive and Interactional Construction of Afro-Brazilian Religious Participation in Brazilian Politics. Please join me in welcoming Elina Hartikainen. Thank you. Um, and um, as you maybe can see from the title slide, the title has actually s changed slightly. Um, for those of you who might have read the abstract on the website, this is not quite what I described in the abstract, um, but hopefully you'll still find it interesting. Um, okay. Vamos a deliberar. Let us deliberate. With these words, Marcos Hezenji, a black movement activist and practitioner of the Afro-Brazilian religion Candomblé, called on his fellow religious practitioners to join an act of collective deliberation in Salvador, Brazil, in November 2009. The deliberations were the culminating moment of a two-day meeting of Brazil's Afro-Brazilian religions that inaugurated an activist project called uh, the Foro Nacional de Religiões de Matriz Africana, the National Forum of African Origin Religions. The Forum Nacional, as its practitioner activist proponents repeatedly explained during the event, had two interconnected aims. First, it sought to establish an organizational structure for practitioners of Brazil's many Afro-Brazilian religions to come together and discuss shared concerns and also to construct a shared and unified agenda to present to government representatives. And second, it aimed to establish an organ that could communicate this agenda and represent all Afro-Brazilian religions to such government actors. To accomplish this, the forum's activist designers had turned to the model of participatory democracy. Like the deliberative citizens' policy forums that had prolifer proliferated in Brazil in the previous years, the forum was envisioned as a structure of nested meetings in which proposals developed through deliberative conversations on one level, for example that of small groups of neighboring temples, were brought together with others at the next level, which in turn produced a proposal for the next level, and so on until the national level was reached. Now, the carefully moderated deliberation that followed Hezenji's call supported these political arguments well. The event's audience of several hundred religious practitioners dressed in elaborate ritual attire responded to the call with enthusiastic applause. As the applause died down, deliberation could begin. The topic was the location of the following year's national meeting, not a simple question for a movement that sought to present itself as distinct and independent from the various regionally based organizations that had contributed to the forum's design. Representatives uh, from the four cities under consideration, uh, Sao Paulo, Rio de Janeiro, Recife, and Brasilia, moved to the front of the meeting to present their arguments. A short discussion on the merits of the individual cities followed, but the choice was clear. Since one of the primary goals of the event was to improve state recognition of and support for practitioners of Afro-Brazilian religions and to better include their concerns and perspectives in Brazilian political discussions, Brasilia was without doubt the strongest candidate. The representatives for the other cities conceded and the decision was sealed with a show of hands by the event's participants. The excitement over the decision was tangible. The forum was heading to the nation's capital, but also, and even more significantly, the ways in which deci the decision to do so had been made showed the unifying power of deliberative political practice. Now, the adoption and adaptation of participatory democratic political practice by religious practitioners may sound odd. When we talk about participatory democracy, we tend to focus on participatory governance or leftist social movements experiments with the form. But religious groups are fairly absent in these discussions. And yet, as the example of the Foro Nacional indicates, at least in Brazil, they too have been swept into the fervor and excitement over participatory democracy's political potential. As I suggest in this paper, analyzing such apparent oddities provides a fruitful perspective for exploring the malleability and limits of participatory democracy as a political form, and by extension, the ways in which its practical realization is ordered and conditioned by the larger political agendas and structures to which it's connected. So I focus my attention on examining how the activists in, involved in the pro project at the Foro Nacional work to adopt participatory democratic political technologies and values um, and adapt them to a religious project that otherwise positioned respect for religious and age hierarchies at its core. To this end, I explore the ways in which these activists work to structure the project and justify it to its practitioner addressees. 
In addition, I examined two discursive and interactional innovations through which these activists work to create a sense of a discursive environment in which all practitioners, irrespective of their religious or activist backgrounds, could participate equally. A discursive, discursive emphasis on a collective we and the modification of religious blessing requests. As I show, these practices not only contributed to the construction of the Forum Nacional as a religiously inclusive space, but they also complicated the broader hierarchically grounded politics of respect that the activists subscribe to. And just to give you a little bit more context. Uh, so in the early 2000s, Brazil was a global leader in experiments with participatory democracy. From participatory budgeting to participatory policy making, Brazilians were invited to participate in the process of political decision making on all levels of government. The most famous of these experiments surely is the adoption of participatory budgeting in Porto Alegre that I imagine many of you have heard of, uh, which, and which has served as a model for cities around the world. But participatory democratic forms of governance also went well beyond these experiments in participatory budgeting in Brazil. Indeed, during the first decade of the 2000s, municipalities across the nation adopted a variety of measures that aimed to create opportunities um, for citizens to participate directly in policy deliberation. So for example, there are various kinds of community consultative um, councils um, and participatory forums organized all over the country. Now, these municipal efforts were also further complemented by efforts to include citizens in the development of national level policy through the organization of deliberative um, nested meetings um, or forums that extended from the municipal to the federal level. And the core idea of these was to bring citizens' policy suggestions to debate in ever greater forums. Now, in the context of early 2000s Salvador, the city where the Forum Nacional was inaugurated in 2009, the adoption and realization of participatory governance was deeply intertwined with concerns over recruiting the city's Afro-Brazilian populations into a broader governing project of active citizenship. Active citizenship, as Evelina Dagnino and James Holson have described, was a model of citizenship that was first forwarded by social movements invested in the rights-based politics of citizenship and that was gradually adopted as a governing ideology in Brazil between the 1980s and early 2000s. As large numbers of social movement activists who subscribed to this model of citizenship entered into government positions. And this new understanding of citizenship was de definition an active one, um, as it not only emphasized the citizen subject's possession of rights, but also his or her capacity as a political actor to define what they were and to struggle for the recognition. In this model, the state's responsibility was to ensure that the voices of citizens were heard and their rights respected, while the responsibility of the citizen was to both know their rights and to actively make demands on the state for their recognition. Um, and the relationship between the state and uh, the citizens was seen predominantly in a frame of partnership. Now, in Salvador, practitioners of the Afro-Brazilian religion Candomblé were a special target of government institutions' efforts to recruit Afro-Brazilians into participatory projects. On one level, they were considered to be the quintessential representatives of Salvador's Afro-Brazilian populace. Not only were Candomblé practitioners celebrated as the guardians of Brazil's African culture and religious roots, uh, but also the majority of them were lived in the city's impoverished Afro-Brazilian communities. And on another level, practitioners' mass mobilization in the late 1990s and early 2000s against religious intolerance and attacks by evangelical Christians positioned them as exemplars of activist citizenship. So considering this context, it was no great surprise that the model for the Forum Nacional was developed by Salvador's Candomblé activists. Indeed, many of them were seasoned participants of government-sponsored um, participatory democratic forums and community councils. In an interview I conducted in September 2009, Lindinado de Paula, a Candomblé activist from Salvador, explained that the model for the Forum Nacional had emerged quite serendipitously from an effort by the Bahian branch of an activist group called Colectivo de Entidades Negras, um, the Collective of Black Entities, to better reach Candomblé practitioners in the city's peripheries. According to Lin Ginalva, the collect collective had begun to experiment with organizing meetings at Candomblé temples located in Salvador's periphery when they realized that practitioners from these temples rarely participated in active events, events organized in the city center due to lack of time or money for paying transportation. How as the meetings progressed, the collective's members quickly realized that the temple meetings could in fact act as sites for developing the conversational agenda of larger events. By the November 2000 inauguration of the Forum, the local meetings had come to be reimagined as the starting point of a nested structure of meetings that stretched to the national level, and their activist promoters had expanded to include representatives from Afro-Brazilian religions, traditions, and activist groupings from all over Brazil. 
In addition to providing a structure for including practitioners from peripheral temples and activist conversations, the forum had come to be envisioned as a means to resolve and transcend two key challenges that Afro-Brazilian activists had faced over the previous years. Firstly, the difficulty of unifying practitioners from across the nation's diverse and oftentimes competing Afro-Brazilian religious traditions and activist groups, and secondly and relatedly, the resulting inability to present a unified front when engaging government institutions. Now, um, as one might expect, when the Forum Nacional aim, what the Forum Nacional aimed to do and why it was necessary was the central topic of conversation at the inaugural event that was held in November 2009. Overall, there was a sense of urgency in practitioner activist voices. On one hand, they pointed to the continuing growth and increasing violence of evangelical Christian attacks against Afro-Brazilian religions. And on the other hand, the growing government interest in recruiting practitioners of Afro-Brazilian religions into projects of active citizenship had created a situation in which the religions practitioners both could, but also had to mobilize politically to demand government recognition of and support for their religious freedoms. So practitioners of Afro-Brazilian religions had worked to respond to these challenges in a variety of ways over the previous decade. They'd organized large marches and conferences, lobbied and conversed with local governments, traveled to Brasilia to speak with then-President Lula um, and other representatives of his government, and organized various kinds of media campaigns. However, the majority of these efforts had been locally based and frequently they'd competed with each other for attention. It was this situation that advocates of the forum at the November 2009 event argued it was designed to respond to and transcend. The forum provided a structure, they argued, that could bring practitioners from across competing religious traditions and activist groups together on an equal footing and in so doing provide the foundation for developing a unified agenda for all Afro-Brazilian religions for presentation to government representatives and institutions. Now, key to the forum, as one activist, Yalo Richa Dolores, a temple leader from Rio de Janeiro, argued, was that it had no owner or leader. She used the Portuguese word dono. Although it had been designed by practitioners from um, SEIN um, and several other large religious activist collectives, it was not affiliated with or directed by any of them. Instead, it aimed to provide a structure in which decisions on a collective political agenda could emerge directly out of practitioners' deliberate discussions with each other. Now, equally essential was the notion that the unified agendas that the Forum strove to create already existed in preliminary form. That is, underneath the differences between the various Afro-Brazilian religious traditions, the Forum's activist advocates argued was a shared commitment to the religion's African ancestors, a shared set of values and capsules and concern for respecting elders, and a shared understanding of the interdependent relationship between humans and the divine. The structure of the Forum, as Baba Diba, Another activist advocate and a temple leader from the state of Rio Grande do Sul put it, would allow for both bringing out the pre-existing unity among Af practitioners of Afro-Brazilian religions and respecting the differences between them. Um, I won't read through the, the whole long quote here, but as you can see, he emphasizes that first that there is unity, um, this forum will really bring this unity together, but at the same time, it will respect all the differences that we have, so it will bring these differences together in a unified voice. Okay, um, now um, I'll turn to examining the discursive and interactional means through which the forum's activist advocates work to constitute as, a, as such an inclusive conversational space. Now, as the decision to end the Forum Nacional's inaugural event with a collective act of deliberation reveals, the project's advocates did not only draw on the structure of nested participatory democracy forums, but also they'd adapted they'd ad they had adopted um, these meetings in emblematic conversational practice, deliberation. Now, while the deliberations that ended the event were the most obvious example, the activist organizers also worked to variously characterize the broader seminar event as a deliberative meeting. Thus, they repeatedly emphasized to attendees that the seminar had been conceived as a conversational forum for practice to come together to discuss and develop strategies for addressing shared political concerns. And furthermore, many of the organizers characterized the overall tenor of the conversations that took place at the event between religious practitioners as deliberative. So the language of deliberation was just all over the, the, play, uh, the, the discussions there. Uh, the actors organizer a strong emphasis on the event's deliberative character served to forward two aims. Um, firstly, the emphasis on deliberation was sure to draw government representatives' attention to Afro-Brazilian religious practitioners' commitment to the forms of participatory democracy and active citizenship um, the government promoted. But secondly, it distinguished the forum as a particular kind of national space for the practitioner participants in attendance. Unlike many other gatherings focused on Afro-Brazilian religions, practitioners' participation in the forum was not predicated on their religious or activist connections. Instead, participation in conversations was ordered by the deliberative ideal of equal voice. 
In addition to such metapragmatic characterizations, the events acted as organizers relied on a set of discursive and international strategies common to other Brazilian deliberative meetings to order speech turns at the event and to construct a sense of collective participation. For example, they asked attendees to add their names to a list if they wished to speak, um, and they timed individual every speech turns in order to ensure each speaker was equally acknowledged. Uh, and they also worked to acknowledge the presence of all religious traditions and activist groups present through the collection of lists of participants' religious and activist affiliations that were then read aloud at regular intervals through the meeting. Uh, this actually took quite a long time um, going through these lists. Um, and they work to include representatives from each religious tradition and activist organization on event panels and in opening incantations to the gods. Um, as a result, the events panels were actually quite large. Some of them had even uh, more than 10 people on them. Um, and um, also the mornings were taken up as easily an hour of um, incantations to the various different deities from the different traditions. Um, now, on the level of discourse, two strategies stood out especially prominently. The first one is the ways in which the forum's activist advocates worked to create a sense of a collectively acting body through the usage of the first person plural um, when describing and addressing the meeting and its participants. And I'm really happy that Masha already talked about um, the use of we. It ties very nicely into my analysis here, too. Um, so the quote from Baba Jiva that I just showed you provides an especially clear example of this. As you can see on the slide, Baba Jiba not only argued that underneath their differences, Afro-Brazilian religions were unified, but he also forwarded this argument through his emphatic and repeated use of the first person plural, we, and its variants. Um, and let me just note for those of you who don't speak Portuguese, um, um, the repeated inclusion of noise um, in these quotes is emphatic. It's not actually grammatically necessary, because the first person plural is already marked in the verb. So such uses of the first person plural provide an especially effective means to both depict the meeting, um, um, its organizers and its attendees as a unified collective, a group of Afro-Brazilian religious practitioners who shared a political project, and also to group those present into this construction. In this sense, they can be seen to have acted as performers in parallel ways, as Michael Silverstein has described for the we pronoun in the phrasing, we the people in the Declaration of the United States that Masha just talked about in the previous panel. Okay, now another key discursive strategy that the forum's activist advocates employed to highlight its participatory democracy inspired conversational footing was the modification of religious blessing formula that are commonly used as openings to public statements at religious activist events. At other religious activist events, these formula had come to be used by practitioners as a key discursive means to communicate their commitments to religious notions of hierarchy and respect for elders. On a general level, the usage of blessing requests at activist events was modeled on temple exchanges of blessings. In temporal context, such blessing exchanges constitute a key ritual of greeting. Um, and importantly, the blessings draw attention to and reprodu reproduce temple hierarchies um, by default as they always involve two pair parts, at the request of a blessing by a hierarchical junior and the offering of one by a hierarchical senior. Um, and the hierarchy structure power of this exchange is ultimately actually predicated on a third actor, the deity whose blessing is being transmitted to the junior practitioner by the senior practitioner. Now, despite their simple form, these kinds of blessing exchanges can be mani manipulated for various kinds of semiotic effects. At their most obvious, they provide practitioners with a means to communicate their adherence to and respect for the religion's hierarchical structures. However, they also present practitioners with a powerful means for communicating their views on the hierarchical structuring of the conversational context in which they're speaking. Now, at the inaugural event of the Forum, the project's activist advocates modified their blessing request to communicate its difference from other religious and activist contexts. In contrast to these other contexts, their blessing request suggests that the Forum Nacional, all practices were considered equal conversational participants. The way in which Tateto Nabomi, a temple leader from the state of Minas Gerais, who had been asked to speak on one of the November seminar panels, began his statement, provides an example of this. Um, <coughs> Okay, so on one level, such modified requests provide an effective means to better acknowledge the event's junior practitioner participants in the statement's addressees, a practice that aligned um, well with the concern with recruiting all participants into a collective we that saw itself as participant in the conversation. However, on another level, the modifications also made it possible for senior practitioners to adhere to the practice of demonstrating respect to the religion's hierarchy while remaining agnostic about the hierarchical relationship between themselves and the many other elderly temple readers present at the event. Indeed, for most of these senior practitioner speakers, none of the event's other participants presented obvious seniors in rank. However, as they well knew, the hierarchical rankings of individual temples were not necessarily viewed as equal by all practitioners, since different temples were understood to have been differently successful in maintaining a connection to the religion's African origin. 
What is more, the length of time a practitioner had been involved in the religion impacted their relative um, relationship. Now, such modifications were frequently also accompanied by efforts to recognize the diversity of Afro-Brazilian religious traditions. Tateta Nabomi's blessing requests provide an example of this as well. Um, as you can see in the slide, he asked for the blessing of several, uh, as a series of divine entities. In addition to his inkisis, he names the Orishas, Voduns, and Kabokus, all of which are spiritual entities that are associated with different Afro-Brazilian religious traditions. Other speakers accomplished a similar communicative effect through phrasing their blessing requests as a series of composed of requests from several traditions. Um, and I give you here um, Leonel Monteiro's opening, um, which you can see starts with um, like a, a list here, like it was Mukuyu, Motumba, Kolofe, Musaleji, and Baluene. These are all um, uh, blessing requests from different um, traditions and uh, Afro Brazilian religions. Uh, so, such modified blessing formula provided forum advocates with an effective discursive means to sidestep the hierarchies that they understood to have constrained previous efforts to organize practitioners of Afro-Brazilian religions. But what were the actual conversations like? Uh, what kind of participation and inclusivity was this um, that was framed by these kinds of um, um, blessing requests, for example? Who spoke at the events? So at the November 2009 uh, forum inauguration, the ways in which the organizers worked to characterize as a deliberative forum and the particular discursive strategies they employed to create a sense of collective participation had a very particular effect on the forum's conversational dynamics. On an overt level, as I've described, they worked to constitute a sense of collectivity and inclusion through th different forms of inclusive address, namely the use of the first person plural to address the event's diverse participants and the modification of hierarchically structured blessing requests. However, on closer examination, despite the forum advocates' overt invocations of deliberative participatory democracy ideals of equality, these strategies were grounded in a different politics of hierarchical flattening. The aim for forum advocates was not so much to get rid of hierarchy per se, as to create a structure in which practitioners from historically competing religious traditions and activist groupings could come together and share discussion. One of the key princi principles that was understood by the forum's activist advocates to make such conversation possible was a shared commitment to respecting religious hierarchies and elders. Now, in temple context, one of the primary areas in which this kind of respect for elders is performed is discourse. Junior practitioners are commonly told that they should refrain from speaking in the presence of the hierarchical seniors, except when requesting blessings. Not only is the junior practitioner's knowledge of religious matters so limited that it's better they remain silent, but also the very act of speaking about the religion constitutes a claim to authority. Speaking out of hierarchical turn thus constitutes a direct affront to the religious status order. In practice, this model is enforced by the very structure of such routine discursive exchange as the blessing exchange, where the junior practitioner's contributions are limited to the set phrasing of the blessing request. Now, this temple-based discursive economy was variously reproduced at the Forum Nacional's ina inaugural event. And this is not surprising, considering that one of the selling points of the Forum Advocates was that despite its invocation of participatory democratic principles, the Forum would also respect and follow Afro-Brazilian religion's religious norms for and practice of a conversation. But it did establish an unconventional grounding for the discursive strategies that act advocates employed. This was most clearly the case for the modified blessing requests. Despite the creative ways in which these modifications expand the address structure of blessing requests to include various Afro-Brazilian religious traditions and practices of all hierarchical ranks, they did not actually change the ways in which the authority to speak at the event uh, was ordered. Quite the contrary. The reliance on the religious formula worked to further ground authority of speech in a religiously determined hierarchical discourse economy. Indeed, a closer examination reveals that the modified blessings could only be used effectively and authoritatively by senior practitioners. Firstly, the very act of status lowering and flattening the modified blessing requests relied upon depended on the speaker holding a status from which such an argument could be made. Junior practitioners could not have employed the modified blessings to the same effect as they did not allow for status lowering of one's addressees. Secondly, the efficacy of the modified requests depended on their speaker's ability to authoritatively make claims on the malleability of religious authority structures. Ultimately, this was an argument that only practitioners in high-ranking positions could claim the authority to make, um, and any effort by a junior practi practitioner to adopt the blessing formula in similar ways would have been taken as an infelicitous claim to authority and as such as a direct affront to the religious hierarchy itself. And the ways in which forum advocates use the first person plural um, as, uh, also pose similar challenges. Like the modified blessing request, this discursive strategy also made claims on the malleability of religious authority structures that only speakers of high religious rank had the authority to make. 
Now, not surprisingly, considering these constraints, um, in the end, not one single lower-ranking practitioner spoke publicly at the event. Although a number of those in attendance wore religious attire uh, that communicated their low rank, these practitioners' participation was limited to listening to panel presentations and raising their hands to vote in the final act of collective deliberation, and even then in accordance with higher-ranking practitioners from their own temple communities. Okay, and I get to my conclusion here now. Thank you. Um, of course, um, collective deliberation rarely, if ever, involves the actual equal participation of all in discussion. On the one hand, participants may not feel the need or interest to speak for a variety of reasons, from agreeing with already expressed opinions to not being particularly invested in the questions under discussion. On the other hand, as the critical scholarship on the public sphere has demonstrated, the forms of speech privileged and deliberative conversation, especially the emphasis on reason-based argumentation in autonomous speaker subjects, not only constrains the ways in which speakers can participate in such conversation, but also excludes those who do not want to or cannot speak in these ways due to their particular subject positions um, and or ideological commitments. Now, as my analysis of the Forum Nacional's inaugural event demonstrates, the very discursive strategy by which a sense of collective participation is created participatory democratic events frequently have a similar effect. Now, most often, such underlying hierarchies and inequalities of participatory democratic forums and deliberative practice are understood as either failures of the political forum's realization that can be fixed with more sophisticated techniques of participatory organization, or as unavoidable products of the socially variegated distribution of linguistic practice. However, uh, the activists who were involved in the Forum Nacional project were more ambivalent about the relationship between hierarchy and participatory democracy. Um, I would have had a long quote, um, which I can just show you here, but I won't go into because we don't have the time, um, expressing exactly this ambivalence. Um, but so um, the case of the Foro Nacional, I would thus like to suggest, allows us to think of the ways in which participatory democratic politics articulate with hierarchy in more robust ways. Rather than a failure to realize a participatory democratic ideal of equality, the Forum Project positions hierarchy at the center of participatory democratic political practice. In so doing, it draws our attention to the multiple ways in which the political forum not only relies on old and produces new, but also intersects with and reorganizes social hierarchies, um, and the ways in which these articulations are motivated by, but also contribute to the broader political agendas and structures in which they occur. Thank you.